Well, when I looked at what the possibilities were, there were opportunities in the mid-90s. Uh, at the time, when the web first came about, for me, mm -hmm. it was very primitive. You know, at best, a very slow display of a still image. This was in stark contrast to the level I was working on in video. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, even a simple page of text information with an image, the ability to have mm -hmm. global or nearly you know, wired world distribution of this information mm -hmm. without the gatekeepers mm -hmm. was intriguing to me. So the question was, as the internet scales, as the data pipes become more consumed with basically television, the inversion of the net, I saw this as a doom in the future, that the edge, the intelligence of the network being at the edge was being re-inverted. The many-to-many -many mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. for example, that Howard Rheingold wrote about that allowed the internet to grow and the establishment of virtual mm -hmm. communities was being inverted and was being sucked in back to a mm -hmm. centralized model of control. Mm -hmm. And once the old media corporations got their hands on the internet and perverted its potential from being a decentralized many-to-many peer-to-peer network back to a centralized one, I saw that the danger was the internet was going to turn into cable TV, where content from the edge would not necessarily reach everybody at the other edge. Mm -hmm. So in 1995, as I saw the internet transition from a research academic network where commercial use was actually forbidden by the acceptable use policy. Mm -hmm. Commercialization of the internet also posed a threat to independent development, mm -hmm. content and production and distribution, especially mm -hmm. distribution. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that was, the premise was the only way to assure the existence and the uh, universal distribution of independent, non-corporate, non-commercial art mm -hmm. content, cultural content, was to be able to buy the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Because unlike the broadcasting spectrum, which is regulated in this country at least, and, and the concept of the global commons, the airwaves, the electromagnetic mm -hmm. frequency spectrum being public resource mm -hmm. like the oceans, the internet in its physical infrastructure is privately, corporately owned. Mm -hmm. So the question was how to establish some kind of public space or public access and assure that in a non-commercial cultural way in this climate of, uh, in this privately owned world. How to create commercial space, I mean how to, I'm sorry, how to create public space mm -hmm. in a commercially owned world. There are three common myths about the internet. That is that the internet is public, that it has no borders, and that it has no center. These are all false. The internet is not public because it's privately owned infrastructure in an unregulated environment. The internet is not borderless, although it appears that we can communicate transparently across continents. Mm -hmm. But in fact, borders are built into the protocol. In fact, what makes the internet able to exchange traffic is a protocol called Border Gateway Protocol, or BGP. Border mm -hmm. Gateway Protocol. And every switch, every router where a network interconnects with another one is a border. And the firewalls are the customs police that decide which packets can pass or not. So it's a very selective and very controlled process. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a map of the internet, it, in my description, is a loose confederation of corporate nation states who control private infrastructure. And they exchange the traffic only because they agree to, not because they're required to. So therefore, at each corporate boundary, at each corporate firewall that of, the, of the network mm -hmm. backbone providers is a border. Mm -hmm. The third myth is that there is no center. There is a center at least as it is in operation today, and that's the root domain. Mm -hmm. The root domain is the center of the internet, which is essential to routing or directing mm -hmm. traffic based on the use of the domain name system. And this essential facility, the root server, the A root server, 
because it's set up in a hierarchical delegation of authority, in a master-slave relationship. Sounds like colonialism somehow. <laughs> hierarchical delegation of authority is a military model. Centralized command and control is a military model. So the fact that people have a perception that the internet has no center and has no borders is only that. It's a perception. It's not a reality. And in fact, the centralized command and control through the root domain is a way of soft switching traffic on and off. For example, the root file, root zone file. The root zone file is a text, text file, ASCII text. To make an entry of a domain or to delete an entry of the domain is a matter of text editing. You could do it with no technical experience. The fact that the company or the entities that control that have very, very strong ties to the US government. They're basically Pentagon contractors or SAIC, for example, who owned Network Solutions at the time of the inception of the namespace lawsuit, mm -hmm. was basically their board of directors. If you were to enter one of their board meetings, you would may make the mistaken impression that you've entered the retirement club of the National Security Agency, mm -hmm. the Pentagon, the CIA, etc., because their board of directors contained the former chiefs of the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, or other government agencies, uh, generals, you know, people like uh, Melvin Laird, who was the Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War, or Bobby Ray Inman, who was the chief of naval intelligence, while George Bush, Sr was the head of the CIA. Donald Hicks, Robert Gates, former head of the CIA. These were basically the ones who were in control of the internet. So SAIC, if you were to look at their corporate profile, their largest customers, you know, they're a private company, privately held. So there's no public disclosure of their finances or anything else because they're not traded on the stock market. Their largest clients are the National Security Agency, the Pentagon, and the IRS and a handful of other like large corporations, Bechtel or something like this. Uh, so what does that tell you is that we have basically the private spooks with their hand on the control point of the internet. Now it's not only a matter of control because if you understand operation of root and top level domain servers, it's also, in my opinion, potentially a key technical point for the functioning of Echelon. Echelon being the so-called global surveillance system. Because what it enables you to do if you were to watch the traffic queries on a root domain server or a top-level domain server, you see high-level traffic transactions for every email message, every web hit that's done virtually all over the internet. So that's a high-level way you can get a behavioral snapshot of who's talking to whom. 